Hi, everyone. Hello. We're in John Wesley Brady. This Freedom Wentz, England Before and After Wesley, and his chapter, Blind Guides, he's been detailing the corruption of the high clergy during this period from 1700 to about 1790. And now he's taking up lesser prelates and their outlook. Mm. Brady says, archbishops of the 18th century, and he quotes Rowden here, were great potentates, not if not princes, a coach and six horses, a private state barge on the Thames with its livery crew, property properly belonged to such a dignitary. Primates, however, had no monopoly on this carnal spirit. In one way or another, the wealthier bishops and deans succeeded in keeping the pace set by their spiritual heads. Even Overton points out that Bishop Hurd, nicknamed the Beauty of Holiness, a prelate who not unnaturally could see nothing but fanatical madness in the evangelical revival, always traveled from his palace to his cathedral a bare quarter mile in his Episcopal coach with his servants in full dress liveries. When he used to go from Worcester to Bristol Hotwells, he never moved without a train of twelve servants. Following the fashion, too, he left behind him an account of his life, nearly a quarter of which is given to describing a visit of the king, George III, to his palace. Jonathan Trelawney, Bishop of Winchester, who died in 1721, used to excuse himself for his much swearing by saying he swore as a baronet and not as a bishop. Thackeray recalls that in the reign of George II, Lady Yarmouth, a court favorite, succeeded in having a certain clergyman made a bishop because he bet her 5,000 pounds that he would not be one, and the lady collected the debt. Bishop Watson, himself playing the role of gentleman farmer, declares that bishoprics are often given to the flattering dependents and unlearned younger branches of noble families, and adds, I saw the generality of bishops bartering their independence and the dignity of their order for the chance of a translation and polluting gospel humility by the pride of prelacy. Bishop Newton's autobiography is a mirror of self-seeking and Dr. Johnson, that is Samuel Johnson, who in, in his dictionary had defined a pension as pay given to a street hireling for tr treason to his country though meanwhile a pensioner himself admitted frankly that no man can now be a bishop for his learning and piety. His only chance of promotion, said Johnson, is being connected with someone who has parliamentary interest. Yet, perversely, Johnson justified this condition. The government in these days, having too little power, he argued, must make all appointments in its own support. It cannot reward merit. Hmm. Seems a perverse point of view. Yeah, it does. It's a business. Nor could it neglect proud family influence. Certain correspondence between Bishop Cornwallis, nephew of our lordly primate, and young Pitt, younger Pitt as prime minister, is here illuminating. In June 1791, Cornwallis wrote, after the various instances of neglect and contempt which Lord Conwall Cornwallis and I have experienced, not only in violation of repeated assurances, but of the strongest ties, it is impossible that I should not feel the late disappointment very deeply. With respect to the proposal concerning Salisbury, I have no hesitation in saying that the see of Salisbury cannot be in any respect an object to me. The only agreement which promises an accommodation in my favor is the promotion of the Bishop of Lincoln to Salisbury, which would enable you to confer the deanery of St. Paul's upon me. I have the honor to be J. Litchfield and Coventry. <clears throat> like his uncle, this <coughs> high-born bishop would persuade the prime minister to juggle other bishops about that he might gain his coveted preferments. It is passing humorous, too, that this peevish prelate is here spurning the see of Salisbury, 
which his uncle, the primate, had coveted, and is coveting the deanery of St. Paul's, which the uncle had spurned. Mm. Were these blue-blooded prelates being whim whimsical to exhibit their breeding? Pitt's reply, in any case, is refreshing. Writing from Downing Street the following day, he was tense and terse. The Prime Minister says, My Lord, that is Litchfield, on my return to town this afternoon, I found your Lordship's letter. I'm willing to hope that on further consideration and on recalling all the circumstances, there are parts of that letter which you would yourself wish never to have written. My respect for your Lordship's situation and my regard for Lord Cornwallis prevent my saying more than that, that until that letter is recalled, your Lordship makes any further intercourse between you and me impossible. I have the honor to be, etc., William Pitt. Now, we might want to add that William Pitt was the youngest Prime Minister Britain had ever had, but mm -hmm. he was quite quite a prodigy. So mm -hmm. it, it says... Had some scruples. Yes, he had some scruples, <laughs> and we'll get to part of the reason why in a few minutes. On receipt of Pitt's reply, Cornwallis revealed a diplomatic capacity for repentance. That same day, June 11th, he wrote, quote, Under the very great disappointment which I have felt upon the last occasion, I am much concerned that I was induced to make use of expressions in my letter to you, of which I have since repented, and which upon consideration I beg leave to retract, and I hope that will make no unfavorable oppression, impression upon your mind. Whatever may be your thoughts regarding the subject matter of the letter, I trust you will have the candor to pardon those parts of it which may appear to be wanting in due and proper respect to you, and believe me to have the honor to be J. Litchfield and Coventry. And that's the end of that letter or quote. Pitt answered expressing great satisfaction in being able to dismiss from mind any impression occasioned by a paragraph in the former letter. But the Cornwallis connection was too influential to be ignored, even by Pitt. So two months later, Bishop Cornwallis was named Dean of Windsor, and in February 1794 was given the rich deanery of Durham. Mm. Yeah, so again we see page after page of the corruption of the church during this century. But at the very same time that is going on, the Prime Minister himself, William Pitt, his best friend is William Wilberforce, mm -hmm. who is going to almost single-handedly turn the conscience of England around in so, one generation. Yeah. So it indicates that that God is there. It's, uh, you know, because otherwise you'd, you'd be very disenchanted reading this history, how mm. it's become a business to these men. But there's mm. always someone around that has scruples. Pitt, Pitt's own conscience, if you know anything about his life, mm -hmm. was guided by not his own convictions, but the convictions of those around him. Mm. Well, he was a very intelligent man. He had a conscience, which was Lum Wilberforce, who was his best friend. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the very same time as all this corruption is going on, some God is working underneath, and you would you probably wouldn't have known that yeah. by just looking at the externals. Mm -hmm. But the next generation would prove it. So we wanted to link on your screen to Vivian series on Wilberforce, where a generation after he's had this great influence back in the eighteen. Um, in the late teens, after the Napoleon threat is over, and after they've already won several victories over the slave trade, Wilberforce writes a book about this, the need for real Christianity to take root in England, mm -hmm. to solve a lot of other social problems and church problems right. that were still very vivid at that time. Mm -hmm. So we'll put that link on your screen. And next time, Brady deals with how to organize a chaos. <laughs>